Welcome to the History Guy podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. On today's episode, the History Guy talks about two forgotten stories of the naval front of the Great War. First, he talks about the first naval battle of the war, which took place on a large lake in East Africa. Then he tells the story of U-156 and the only German attack on the American mainland in World War I, the Battle of Orleans. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. Perhaps the least known and understood front in the Great War was the battle over East Africa. Their colonial troops from Britain, Belgium, Portugal, and Germany fought in an area that was larger than France, Germany, and England combined in an effort to divert each other's resources. The German colonies in West Africa all fell within the first year and a half of war, but East Africa became a protracted conflict. And one way to illustrate the futility of that conflict is to talk about a lesser known front in the lesser known front of the Great War, and that was the efforts to control Lake Nyasa, a colonial backwater characterized by poor supply, confusion, and command neglect. Lake Nyasa was the location of the first naval battle of the First World War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Lake Malawi is one of the African Great Lakes, a series of lakes that are part of the Rift Valley Lakes. The lake, with a surface area of more than 11,000 square miles, is 350 miles long and 47 miles wide at its widest point. The lake borders the modern states of Malawi, Tanzania, and Mozambique. But in 1914, the lake, referred to by the British as Lake Nyasa, straddled the border between the British protectorates of Nyasa land, formerly known as British Central Africa, and northern Rhodesia, their Portuguese allied colony Mozambique, and German East Africa, and thus represented an important strategic feature in the little-known East Africa campaign of the First World War. While fighting in the north, where German East Africa bordered British East Africa and the Belgian Congo was relatively more important to the conflict, Lake Nyasa had strategic importance. The ability to control the lake meant the ability to move troops and supplies and maintain lines of communication in a campaign that, unlike the war in Europe, was highly mobile and one in which lack of supply killed more troops than bullets. As the region was remote, even by colonial standards, resources were limited on both sides. At the outbreak of war, the troops available to Nyasaland were largely concentrated around Fort Johnston at the south end of Lake Malawi. Fort Johnston was named after the British colonial administrator Sir Harry Johnston, and is today called Mangochi. But there was a concern. If the British could not guarantee control of the lake, then Nyasaland could not guarantee control of its north, as it was difficult to move troops and supply to defend it. Control of the lake was, thus, the difference between whether Nyasa land was thrown on the defensive. But British control of the lake was by no means guaranteed, because on a lake so remote that it was extraordinarily difficult to bring up a new vessel, one single vessel of war could control the entire lake, and the Germans had such a vessel, the steamer Hermann von Wismann. The 87-foot, 100-ton, single-screw steamship was built in 1890 by the Hamburg Johnson and Schelinski shipyard. The ship was built in sections in Germany and shipped to East Africa. It was then transported overland and launched on Lake Nyasa in September 1893. The ship was christened SMS Hermann von Wismann, named after a German explorer and administrator who had commanded German troops who put down an 1888 insurrection by the Arab and Swahili population of German East Africa that was called the Abashiri Revolt. While Wismann had been criticized for his brutal tactics in the Abashiri Revolt, he was an ardent anti-slaver, and he had funded the construction of the steamer on Lake Nyasa as a gunboat designed to fight the transport of slaves across the lake. In 1891, the steamer had played a role in efforts to oust a Swahili Arab slave trader named Mlozi, who had established a stronghold on the north end of the lake. Interestingly, von Wismann had also funded the construction of a sister ship, named after his wife, called the Hedwig von Wismann, that was placed on Lake Tanganyika in the north. That ship was the model for the gunboat the Queen Louise that was the target of characters Charlie Allnutt and Rose Sayer in the 1951 film The African Queen. The determination to sink the Queen Louise that the characters played by Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn display in the movie are reminiscent of the determination that the British forces put into trying to remove the threat of her real-life sister ship 
unlike Nyasa. At the outbreak of war, the Hermann von Wismann was one of only three armed boats on Lake Nyasa. As there was a fear the von Wismann might capture other transport steamers and then use them to move an invasion force, all the Nyasa land steamers, numbers are unclear but around 8 to 10 boats, were called to the south end of the lake where most were requisitioned for military service. The British answer to the Hermann von Wismann was the 130-foot armed steamer SS Gwendolen. Named after British author Lady Gwendolyn Cecil, the Gwendolyn was constructed in Fort Johnston in 1898. The Gwendolyn should have been more than a match for the Hermann von Wismann, as it was built to carry four three-pounder cannons. The ship was capable of delivering 300 armed troops with equipment, and when launched, the British had declared her the finest steamship ever to sail on the lake. But there was legitimate reason for concern. The Gwendolyn had a history of mechanical breakdowns and suffered from construction deficiencies. While the ship had been designed to carry four three-pounder cannons, she had only ever been outfitted with one, located on the main deck, where it had a limited range of fire. There was a serious shortage of ammunition for even that one gun, and the crew had not been trained in its use. By comparison, the Hermann von Wismann mounted the one-pounder gun called the pom-pom, so called for the sound it made when firing. While the British were unsure of how many of the guns the ship had, some thought four, others said just one, the one-pounder had advantages over the three-pounder. Essentially a very large machine gun, the one-pounder actually had a greater effective firing range and a much faster rate of fire. The Hermann von Wismann had at least one mounted on its foredeck, giving a much better field of fire. Thus, the Hermann von Wismann would have advantages both in range and maneuver. If the two boats met, the Hermann von Wismann might be able to destroy Gwendolyn before she was even in range. At very least, the two boats were matched well enough that the outcome would be in question and the loss of the Gwendolyn would leave the lake essentially in German hands. The senior British naval officer advised to avoid an encounter. However, there was information that the Hermann von Wismann was laid up for repairs at the German port at the south end of the lake called Sphinxhaven, so called because large rocks in the water resemble sphinxes. The ship might be vulnerable, but surely the outbreak of war on July 28th would have prompted the Germans to speed the repairs and to properly guard the ship. With slow communication lines and indecision, Gwendolyn was finally dispatched August 8th on a mission with conflicting orders and against the advice of her captain, Edmund Rhodes. The lack of confidence in the Gwendolyn was expressed in the orders to the ship. The Gwendolyn will proceed with caution and instructions have been issued for her to not risk an encounter which might prove disastrous to her. But if it is ascertained that the Visman is still undergoing repairs, endeavor will be made to put her out of service unless Sphinxhaven is too strongly defended. The lack of confidence showed in a report by Chief Secretary Hector Duff to Sir George Smith, Governor of Nyasaland. If Gwendolyn meets German ship in open, we'll do as well as possible. To complicate matters, Gwendolyn had been sent with a troop of the King's African Rifles, who, if possible, could be landed nearby to reconnoiter. But the troop had been given the odd order to on no account do so much damage as to absolutely destroy the von Wismann. The orders, it seems, were to disable the ship, but leave it in a state that it could be repaired, as it was hoped that the ship would eventually be captured. That would be a difficult feat against a vessel that was very much capable of defeating the Gwendolyn. British fears were realized when an official reported seeing an unidentified steamer on the lake, suggesting the Hermann von Wismann was repaired and active. And so on August 13th, 1914, two ships of war, neither one large, but both very important to their tiny part of the war, were about to engage in what could be the decisive battle for the control of Lake Nyasa, and what would be the first naval battle of the First World War. In fact, the fact that the first naval battle of the war occurred on distant Lake Nyasa is proof that the war was a world war. And that much anticipated and feared battle was anticlimactic. When Gwendolyn arrived at Sphinxhaven, not only did they find the Hermann von Wismann still laid up for repairs, but the port was completely undefended. The captain and crew of the Hermann von Wismann had not yet been informed that Germany and Britain were at war. While the government of German East Africa had been informed of the declaration, Sphinxhaven was a remote outpost, and word had simply not gotten there. If Rhodes ever filed an official report, it has been lost, and while there are many stories, there are no actual contemporary accounts of the battle. What we do know is that the Gwendolyn fired on the laid-up Hermann von Wismann, and the ship's captain, a man named Brandt, rowed a boat out to the Gwendolyn to demand an explanation, only to be taken as a prisoner of war. 
Some popular accounts have Brandt yelling, God damn, Rhodes, are you drunk? Although that is likely apocryphal. The ship's chief engineer was found in his bunk and also taken prisoner. The troops from the Gwendolyn then removed the von Wismann's gun and other equipment so as to render her disabled. The steamer the British resident had reported operating on the lake was apparently him mistaking the Gwendolyn. Governor Smith reported to London, We are now in command of the lake and have all steam vessels under our control. Thus went the first great naval victory for the Royal Navy in the Great War. The victory allowed the British to release the other steamers for operation, allowing them to concentrate a part of the Nyasaland field force on the border with German East Africa that in September, and with the help of fire from the Gwendolyn, defeated a German force of approximately equal size, the only significant action of the war to take place in Nyasaland. But the British were still worried that the Germans would repair and come calling with the Hermann von Wismann. The British made several more raids to the still largely undefended port, doing more damage to the ship and destroying workshops and spare parts. Slowly, supplies and reinforcements arrived at Fort Johnston, and the Gwendolyn had two additional six-pounder guns mounted. Control of the lake seemed assured, but then a new threat emerged. In October, the German light cruiser SMS Konigsberg had been trapped in the Rufiji River in German East Africa by a British naval squadron. Konigsberg was blockaded, but several of her large guns had been removed, and now there was a rumor that one of the large guns was being taken to Sphinxhaven to mount on the Hermann von Wismann. While the local authorities knew the rumors were likely false, they could not be ignored, as the guns were large enough to challenge any boat on the lake. In May 1915, a mission was dispatched to put an end to the threat by attempting to capture and refloat the Hermann von Wismann, then assumed to be under repairs. The Gwendolyn, along with a smaller armed boat, the Chauncey Maples, conveyed more than 200 troops for the mission. This time there was a force of German Ascaris, native troops, defending the port, and in a spirited battle, a British volunteer, a noted elephant hunter named Jimmy Sutherland, was killed. The Germans defended a redoubt, which the Gwendolyn shelled with her six-inch guns, but as the ship only had armor-piercing ammunition and no shrapnel, caused few if any casualties. When the British finally took the redoubt, they found the German force had escaped, leaving behind a single defender to be taken prisoner, a dachshund. Only two men, Sutherland and a single German Ascari casualty, were known to die in the fight. But the force soon found that the Hermann von Wismann was not being repaired at all, and once again the British obsession with the vessel was far greater than any apparent German interest. Because of all the damage that they themselves had done, it was clear the ship would take more than a month to repair, while German reinforcements were on their way. In fact, the troops had to re-embark under fire. The tiny battle, which was presented as a victory as the Hermann von Wismann was finally decided to be beyond repair, received outsized enthusiasm in Britain, where any good news was highly prized in the face of the huge losses being taken in Europe. The Royal Navy finally sunk the Konigsberg in July of 1915, but her big guns, which had been removed, were used throughout the East African campaign, and that meant that the ghost of the Konigsberg continued to worry Allied officials throughout the campaign. The little-remembered East African campaign was the result of a force in German East Africa under German General Paul Emil von Leto Vorbeck, whose role it was to divert as many Allied troops and resources as possible. The campaign was the longest of the war and resulted in nearly 60,000 European casualties and hundreds of thousands of casualties among native troops and porters, most of whom died of disease and starvation. As the campaign moved, they destroyed crops and villages, leading to both famine and greater susceptibility to the 1918 influenza pandemic. Millions died as a result. As much as 20% of the population of German East Africa, including the modern-day countries of Burundi, Rwanda, and most of Tanzania, died as a result of the conflict and the influenza. One British colonial official remarked that the losses in East Africa were not a scandal only because the people who suffered most were the carriers, and after all, who cares about native carriers? While this tiny fight over the Hermann von Wismann, which the Germans never managed to sail during the course of the war and didn't even bother to try to repair, might seem irrelevant, it actually was meaningful. It meant the British had control over Lake Nyasa, which protected lines of transport, of communication, and of supply. And because the British controlled Lake Nyasa, they were able to, in 1916, take a combined Rhodesia-Nyasa field force under the command of General Sir Edward Northey and invade German East Africa almost without opposition. And at that point, the Hermann von Wismann was captured by the British, repaired, and renamed the HMS King George. 
The ship continued to sail on Lake Nyasa, clear until 1950. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. So, you know, World War I has become, in a lot of ways, kind of the more obscure of the two, you know, 20th century, 20th century World Wars. Yeah. And uh, World War II just gets a lot more attention. I think we've seen uh, it does. more attention toward World War I in some ways. We've seen more movies. Well, we did, especially around in the last couple of years, yeah. in the 18 and 19, when we were talking about the the, uh, the centenary of the, of the war. So from 2014 to 2000. And then, it, then again, you know, we, there's not that much discussion of it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think certainly it's the lesser known, and certainly people are more likely, I think, Think to be avid, uh, you know, uh, studying the Second World War, uh, but I mean, the, you know, the Great War. I mean, not only did it set up the First World War, but I mean, it was very, very interesting historically. It's it's interesting in what it did for politics and and yeah. uh, its connection to the uh, to the pandemic, the the 1918 pandemic. All sorts of things are just fascinating. But the the naval war, particularly because uh, I mean, that's so strange with the Great War because really one of the primary drivers of the Great War was a was a naval arms race. You know, Al Alfred Thayer Mahan came out mm -hmm. and, and and he came. Up with this theory that that national prestige and, and the world was going to be ruled by battleships and everybody starts building battleships and this is truly the era of the battle we find out really by world war ii by the start of world war ii the era of the battleship is really over in that they're you know they're not they're no longer be, going to be a battle fleet they're, they were essentially used as a bombardment fleet in the, in the second world war so this is this period where you have these massive uh, uh after the uh after the dreadnought, I mean, you these massive single gun steel hold battleships are real modern battleships and everybody's building them and that's leading to this naval arms race. Uh, and uh, that's just almost no part of yeah. the First World War. I mean, you, 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 you know, you've got uh, Jutland, which was really not that much of a battle. It's sort of a you know a little running fight where they, they didn't really change anything. And then for the most part, those battleships, you know, the British battleships kept the German battleships from doing anything, and so they sat and looked at each other for the whole yeah. war. And uh, so it's really when you go to talk about uh, the the First World War, it's interesting. The thing that started the First World War is very little part of the discussion of the First World War. And even when you talk about the naval war of the First World War, I mean, the fascinating part is things like Lake Nyasa yeah. because it ends up that everybody had built so many battleships that they couldn't use. So, uh, and so it was. It was submarines. It was strange. It was strange things that they hadn't expected. So, yeah. but it also is. It is so indicative of that war. Which I mean, when people think of it as a world war, I don't. You know, I don't think people really understand. I still. I still think when they talk about it as a world war, they think about it as, as a European war. Yeah. In fact, really, from where we are, I barely even talk about the you know the the, the Eastern Front at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, they talk about it being a world war, and yet all we talk about is like France and Belgium. I mean, that's, that's where we tend to put all of our focus. It was truly a world war, and the and the, the fighting in the African colonies was really really fascinating. And the idea that the first naval battle of the war occurred yeah. on Lake Nyasa. Uh, is uh, is just absolutely interesting, and uh, to, I, I do have to mention here though by my my nephew, your cousin uh, uh, Nicholas Herman, uh, and he's a great guy. He, he's uh, flying for the Navy now. We're very proud of Nick, uh, and uh, Nick was with the Peace Corps in Africa, and he visited Sphinx Sphinxhaven, and Sphinxhaven where the where the battle occurred, and and he posted on that, and that's that's how we got the topic idea. So thanks to Nick. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it's really uh, yeah. I, I wish I could go to Sphinxhaven just to stand there and say I was here where the first battle of the the first First naval battle of the First World War was fought. It's ultimately, uh, but really then it is becomes such an interesting little. It's it, you know this little lake that's out. I mean, no one would. Uh, mo most people that you would ask, you know, in the United States would have no idea what where that. I've never heard of it. Yeah. It's not a little lake. It's oh, actually, right, quite right. It's a actually a large, large lake. lake yeah, but... those, those rift lakes are really big. <laughs> but we don't, you know, we don't, we don't even think about them. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, that this and how important it really was in the in the end, uh, maybe it was more important that controlling the lake kept Germany yeah. from being able to cross the lake and attack Nyasa land and and uh, make it, you know, big because it was a big roving battle there. But yeah. I mean, it kept Germany all on one side of that lake. But I mean, it is it's fascinating how important this lake is and the thing about the lake is not that it's small it's actually quite large the thing is is that it's so remote there's yeah. no good you can't sail a boat up to it you literally they literally had to take these boats in parts haul them overland to the port uh, and construct them there and that's yeah. why there were so few on the on the thing and these are you know I, I guess you would say that the that the that the two ships were were uh, uh, built as as warships, yeah. but I mean, really not. They're, they're just they're river steamers, uh, and so they're it's a it's really a fascinating story. Though in the end, an anticlimactic battle. In the in the end, the story of the battle is the Germans didn't know they were at war yet, so <laughs> which is yeah, so <laughs> so so comical. Yeah, the, that's that's the entertaining part of this is that the 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 British are just sure that the Germans are gonna yeah. are gonna and and. 
ultimately, I guess, if you if you want to think about the German goal in that part of the world uh, is to tie mm -hmm. up, you know, British resources, they didn't do a bad job, except that they didn't necessarily uh, ever think about the boat. The boat tied up apparently a lot of British uh, time and resources that uh, w was unnecessary because the Germans really never, interest and information, yeah, never thought and, about. You know, it. They, they hauled extra guns to to strap them to the Gwendolyn and all that sort yeah. of stuff. And the Gwendolyn never used her guns except to shoot at this <laughs> <laughs> a ship that was literally not in the <laughs> Lay, laying on its side the entire war. <laughs> and then eventually the British did uh, uh, did capture it and refloat her too. That's interesting yeah, too. It took it took them a while because at first when you hear these, they're like, oh, don't destroy it because we might want to. We might want to reuse it. I'm like, I don't know. That seems a little delusional. And maybe you should yeah. just destroy it, because uh, then there's no there's no chance that the Germans will, uh, you know, bring it back. Whereas, you know, you having to capture it causes. But it was it was the more uh, the you know the more warshipy of the of the pair, I suppose. Um, even though ultimately it wasn't really uh, it wasn't it yeah, wasn't as powerful as as they feared. I, it never had. It was. Yeah, you know, it's and... interesting. Those those one pounder pom poms. Yeah. Uh, they were. I mean, it was, it's a very large machine gun, and and they actually ended up being very good weapons. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting because you, you'd have a lot of those on on any given ship of the yeah. day. Uh, I'd love to. The you know it, it involves the Konigsberg, which is a really yeah. interesting story too, uh, because the the I mean the ship ended up being you know not doing anything, but the fact that they took our big guns off and rolled them into yeah. Africa again tied up the British resources the entire war. Worrying about where they had taken the guns from the, the Comicsburg, yeah. which is a which is there's a really good uh, there's a good movie um, called Shout at the Devil with uh, Lee Marvin uh, uh, that's about uh, the Comicsburg. It's a, it's a, and uh, it's a, it's a really fun movie. If, if anybody listening here, if you have time, go check out Shout at the Devil. It's a really fun. Uh, Roger Moore is in that too. Uh, but uh, so, I mean, it ties it together. It's really amazing how that really ties to the Africa campaign, which isn't really discussed. And you know, it does it talks about. You know the the horrors of that Africa campaign really it killed just uh, it killed huge numbers of of civilians of villagers of uh, people that were pressed into yeah. service and ended up dying of disease or star starvation it was it was a terrible front of the war yeah. and now we you know now we hardly even talk about yeah, it. yeah that's you know and the oddest front of that was the naval part of the of the Africa campaign on Lake Nyasa. yeah it is I you know uh, you were talking about how we could forget how how big a world war it is and this is really a great example of that because this is a place where uh, I think people forget that Germany even had colonies in Africa, um, and that, mm -hmm. you know, that was that was really where Germany's colonies were. Um, they they didn't have as much. You know, they, they well they were late to the you know Germany wasn't a United Nation at, at the at the time that Spain yeah, was at the time of the, the imperial the period yeah stuff. yeah so so but, they, I mean but they they also had West African colonies those did, fell yeah. fairly quickly. Yeah. But I mean, this 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 ended up being this campaign where uh, they chased each other all around Africa, yeah. and they mostly didn't die from fighting each other. They mostly died from walking through Africa, which could be, yeah, you know, a good well, way to die. There. People died of starvation and disease, destroying the food you know, the, crops, and... destroying the food crops behind them, and yeah, and so you know, causing mass starvation. Yeah, it's it's tragic uh, because it's it's this is a part of the war that you know honestly uh, people know nothing about. Uh, even if mm -hmm. even if you are fairly familiar with World War One, you're unlikely to know that much about this. Uh, and it was it was an absolute tragedy for a part of the world that I, I think that we just don't even realize. Yeah, uh, I mean, why it was a World War, but why, I mean, why you have to think they were wondering why they were involved seriously in the war? Yeah, what was well, and there was yeah. never uh, ultimately there was there was you know there was some strategic. They, you wanted to keep your colonies. I mean, you didn't want to lose your colonies, uh, especially for where that would put you after the war. You know, these colonies were valuable economically, but yeah, I mean, there, there was fighting there for a reason, yeah. and there's a reason they had to put resources into it. But I mean, the people whose village Oh, yeah. come through and destroy all the food so that the army behind them couldn't eat yeah that's... you know and then they and then they starve all winter and then they also probably brought the flu with them yeah. uh and then you know you're standing there your village used to have 300 people and now there's seven of you left and you're like what what do we do pretty pretty uh, and, and it, it, it's got to feel pointless the of world war. i mean you look back at it now it, you know 100 years out and it sure, sure feels like that part of the war was uh was very much a side side theater a side show oh, yeah. to everything else and it's like my gosh yeah. that was the human cost well, you, of something you like see that. that in the nature of these of the boats that yeah. are in the story i mean that they're how i mean <laughs> when you're that far i mean that the you know the british boat had one gun uh they only had a little bit of ammunition yeah. the crew had never fired the gun <laughs> yeah, that's that's how remote we are that's how much attention that they were putting into that 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and there's there's funny parts of the story too. Whatever yeah. they they captured a dachshund. And, yeah. And, and, yeah, that and, was that. Well, there were the, never the German captain rose out of a boat arguing, are you, yelling, "Are you drunk?" And they capture him. What are you doing? Why are you attacking? He doesn't even know they're at well, war. Why shoot him a boat? Yeah, he doesn't know at war. Yeah, uh, but that, you know, and this was ultimately the 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 fight on the lake, and because they you know end up attacking the ship before it ever even gets out on the water and they, they think it's repaired and apparently someone had just misidentified the, the Gwendolyn. <laughs> that all yeah, that was stuff, their own boat that they thought it was. It was, yeah. was very important to, you know, ultimately how that battle, uh, how the fighting was fought because that, that determined uh, where they could move troops and who could move troops and, and stuff yeah. like that. But it was, uh, it, it ends up being, you know, essentially nothing goes on in that lake because they were they managed to be so effective at the front end of it. But it at is the front end of it with their with the one boat, with the one with the one boat <laughs> yeah. that was poorly armed. And, and it's interesting it's when they go out on the thing. They're like, ah, oh, you know, we'll do the best we can. And, and the kind of the orders are run away if you see it. And, they, and <laughs> yeah. it turns out it's not even floating. Yeah, it's totally uh, uh, you know it's it's an interesting part of the world. And those those steamers, I, I you know, if you look at pictures today, I mean, because the steamers were used all over the the, the rift lakes, mm-hmm. uh, and there's a lot of them. Just you know, you know, you can't get rid of them when they're done too, and they're just sitting there, sitting on the you know on the shore, rotting away. Well, it's, uh, and, it is uh, those, incredibly remote. And some of those <laughs> operated, I think, into the '60s. Some of those yeah, steamers were, that they were using there in the first. Yeah, world you were mentioning yeah. that that you know they eventually refloat the. Uh, the uh, what, what was it called the Visman and uh, mm-hmm. are able and it stayed in service for for decades after you know after World War One. Yeah. Well, it's it's a lot it's a lot easier to fix one than to try to make a new one on well, the, or on try to carry it out there. But yeah, this was an area that didn't have you know they didn't have the the uh, manufacturing to build the ship yeah. like that on the lake. And uh, these days, I mean, I have no idea what what kind of ships they they bring out there. Probably easier for us to move I mean, boats. Still, still like steamers, I think, are going in there on Lake Lake Malawi now. Yeah. And, you know, that's. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't know. Ask your average American Lake Malawi. Yeah, that's. Uh, they, they, of course, the average American might have trouble finding Lake Michigan. So I, I don't want to. I don't want to overestimate our geographical yeah, they might knowledge. Not, uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, yeah, but that's you know that's that's it's interesting that we're able to talk about these parts of the world that I mean this is this is in a lot of ways truly forgotten history and these are, these yeah. are people who or would you know would be if yeah. we weren't trying to remember and to say you know yeah. we can't because that was one of the comments I think at the end of one was talking it was a it was a British officer that said that, you know many people died here I died in France but no one cared because they were native yeah. porters and who cares about native porters so yeah. talk about people that deserve to be remembered. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're dying for the German Empire, the British Empire, you know, the, you know, the middle of Mozambique of, you know, starvation because yeah. they pulled you out of your village, uh, you know, is your, is your life less important than the people that were dying there in the Western Front? So, I mean, yeah. it's part of what makes war horrible. It's part of why that war, you know, was, was just such a deadly war. Well, and ultimately, you know, I mean, the, the, you talk about the evils of colonialism. I mean, the, those colonial armies all, all over the place were mostly uh, led by, you know, European officers, but almost... Yeah. huge numbers of the soldiers were going to be uh were, were native were soldiers, native soldiers. Yeah. and they were not uh taken care of very well and as we saw in this one they were poorly supplied uh no one was really concerned about that and you're right it's because you know they were just the native porters so uh yeah. if you lost if you lost thousands of them in a battle that didn't really seem to mean anything anyway uh, wasn't it wasn't a big deal to the yeah. higher ups they were this this long fight yeah was and, and now we even forget them yeah. so it, it deserves to be remembered i mean and it is you know it's significant in being the first naval battle yeah. of the First World War. And at the time, uh, there was not a lot of good news for the British Empire. It yeah. was actually touted as being a much bigger battle than it, you know, than it ever was. Uh, it was touted as if you know, we, were, we were beating the Germans in the yeah. field. <laughs> we're, we're winning. In <laughs> we, were the... shooting, we were shooting the boat that was laying on the shore with the guys. But it was a, a major war. victory in East Africa. Um, and yeah. this, and you know, it's a part of the uh, this these concepts of we we talk about. I mean, you know, I have talked about this before that, you know, if you go back and read the front page of a newspaper, uh, every day there's stuff that was going on that was you know that was vitally important. The people who were, I mean, it was the front page of the newspaper. These are things that people cared about when they read it, and, uh, uh-huh. and ha- that has just been totally forgotten now. And, and yeah. we we talk about you know that that happens in World War One and World War Two. Gosh, there's the famous the famous one where he tries to capture Rome. Uh, days earlier because he wants that to be on the front the front page news mm-hmm. before and you know mm-hmm. now I, I, uh-huh. that you wonder how how much how worth it was really to to move that a couple of days forward when that's it that's that's the kind of stuff people people forget a lot of that and we no longer are you mm-hmm. know super excited about when he captured Rome and he wanted to be on the front yeah. page at the time yeah capturing Rome was a huge yeah. deal it was the first of the of the ex yeah. capt- uh, capitals captured now I mean we don't 
really, I mean, you don't even talk about the capture of very often. Remember back to that whole Mediterranean front? We don't yeah, talk. that's we talk about it a lot because we like forgotten history. Yeah, and that's I mean, know, which is ultimately how yeah, we talk about the Italy. Well, the, and yeah. you know, the, the the Italy, the Italian front was such a such a big deal at first because well, we're not really talking about that. But but yeah, I mean, these parts, these things that were ultimately very important that people thought were very important at the time, and uh, even uh -huh. were presenting as more important than they actually were <laughs> and then it's it all yeah. just becomes you know essentially forgotten history. yeah and it's utterly forgotten yeah, yeah. I, I this this uh i had nick not uh, been there uh for uh yeah, would we have... the peace corps i mean i might not have known about this and it was really a fun one to study it was yeah. really uh really an interesting story so of course if you listen to us you enjoy forgotten history and we of course love forgotten history that's what we do i uh, and we are, we are able to do this because we are supported through things like, of course, uh, the, the money we get from YouTube, but also from patrons uh, at Patreon mm -hmm. and some other sources mm -hmm. of people who really just truly care about history and want to see us mm -hmm. continue uh, to do this kind of stuff. It does. It, it really helps us to pay. I mean, it's a small organization, the History Guy. There's three of us that work for the History Guy. But uh, a, a chunk of that is the money that we get through these channels. So yeah. if you like history, if you like the History Guy, if you enjoy these podcasts or if you enjoy us on YouTube, uh, then it's fairly easy to come and be able to to give a little bit more money to keep the history guy going uh, and keep you know pay the employees and keep making uh, talking about history that deserves to be remembered uh, there's a few places you can go you can go to YouTube and become a member uh, you can uh, become a patron on patreon we also have a, a community at locals uh, and you get some stuff like whenever we have sponsored uh, videos then you'll get a version without the sponsored ads and and uh, and we make some uh, specific content for them uh, for those channels uh, but uh, there are ways that you can give uh, you know, if you're given a dollar or three dollars a month uh, then that makes a huge difference to us in the end, and it helps us to preserve history that otherwise might be forgotten. And if you really love the History Guy, then we have some new opportunities going on right now, and that is we're doing some trips with the History Guy. These, the idea of these trips is just that, you know, we've been talking about for a long time, they kind of got scuttled by COVID, but uh, it was just to go someplace where there's history and have fun. We found a some people that we can work with to do that in a way that's really cool. So there's a couple of spots left if you want to travel with uh, the history guy from Germany down to Austria in June. I think there's a couple spots on that one. There's several spots left if you want to spend a few days next June with me in London uh, and that's going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of really cool stuff on that schedule that you wouldn't necessarily do if you were not normally going to London. Plus, we just added a coach trip uh, in D.C., in Washington, D.C., in March. Uh, and that trip, uh, uh, I mean, it covers uh, uh, your hotel. It covers most of the meals. It covers the coaches and all the tours. It's going to go a lot of places, uh, some of the places that you would typically go because we're going to be there in D.C., but some places you don't typically go. It's going to also go to places like Ford Theater and Mount Vernon. Uh, it's uh, going to go to the National Archives and to the Library of Congress. Uh, we're going to see the Supreme Court, but we're also going to see the, you know, the Capitol building. Uh, and it's a great way. I'll be on the coach with you. So it's a great way for you to meet the history guy and talk. And if you look at the if you look at the cost of it, we've really tried to keep these costs right. So we especially when consider hotel rates and everything that's on there. These are I think these are running at a really really good rate. So there's slots available if you're interested, uh, and uh, you can uh, get those on our webpage at thehistoryguy.com. You can also you know give us a donation there if you want to just donate to uh, keep keeping history alive. If you think history deserves to be remembered, and, and so there's a lot of ways you can support the history guy and keep these podcasts going, and uh, and you know learn about things you might not have heard about like the the battle at Lake Nyasa. Next up, the History Guy tells the story of the Battle of Orleans, the only time that the German Navy attacked the American mainland in World War I. Over the course of the First World War, a number of nascent technologies like airplanes or radio developed to the point that they were much more mature technologies that would then go on to transform the world. And one of those technologies that developed during the war was the technology of submarines. While military submarines had been developing rapidly over the course of the 19th century, they really only became a practical tool of warfare in the Great War. On September 5, 1914, the Imperial German Navy submarine U-21 sank the British scout cruiser HMS Pathfinder and became the first submarine in history to sink another ship using a torpedo that was self-propelled. And the German U-boats would go on to sink more than 5,000 ships over the course of the war. By the end of the war, German U-boats were able to operate off the coast of America, which itself represented a significant development in the technology over what submarines had been able to do even at the beginning of the war in 1914, and resulted in a little remembered event where the Imperial German Navy was able to attack the shores of America itself. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In July of 1916, a notable event occurred. 
the German submarine Deutschland arrived in Baltimore. The Deutschland was an interesting novelty. It was a merchant submarine. While submarines, which had seen limited practical use before the First World War, were primarily known as weapons of war, the Deutschland was instead a non-militarized response to war. While the U.S. still remained neutral as the Great War raged in Europe, a blockade by the powerful British Royal Navy had essentially cut off trade between the United States and the Central Powers. The Deutschland, with a length of 315 feet and a cargo capacity of 350 tons, was the largest submarine ever built but unarmed, lacking both torpedo tubes or a deck gun. In fact, the U.S. Coast Guard was allowed to inspect the boat for weapons to ensure that it met the definition of a merchant vessel under the rules of neutrality. The Deutschland was a blockade runner. The submarine was used to evade the British blockade and, in this case, trade in chemicals used for industrial dyes, something at which Germany excelled and which had been in short supply in the U.S. since the beginning of the British blockade in 1914. And while crowds in Baltimore greeted the visit of the Deutschland, whose successful journey was indeed remarkable, enthusiastically, the visit to the United States by the world's largest submarine was an action steeped in politics. The British and French had objected to the U.S. allowing the Deutschland's trip, arguing that submarines were by nature weapons of war, but the U.S. had rejected that claim. British and French warships waited just outside American territorial waters, hoping to sink the blockade runner the moment it left the protection of American neutrality. While the sympathy of the U.S. public largely favored the Allied powers in the war, there was a large population of German Americans in Baltimore, and the choice of Baltimore Harbor by the Deutschland was clearly intended to remind the administration of Woodrow Wilson that support for the British and French side in the war was far from universal in the United States. Moreover, the overwhelming attitude was one of maintaining American neutrality. Wilson was, in fact, running for re-election on a campaign that touted, he has kept us out of war. The Deutschland was intended as evidence to support the case that America could continue to remain neutral, as Germany hoped to forestall U.S. entry into a war in which they saw their opponents near exhaustion and collapse. Its voyage also offered hope to the Germans back home, suffering under the British blockade. But finally, and maybe most importantly, the voyage of the Deutschland was a warning. Germany had responded to the British blockade with submarine warfare. If the U.S. did decide to enter the war, the voyage of the Deutschland was intended as a message to President Wilson and the American public that Germany could bring their submarine war directly to America's shores. On August 1st, the Deutschland departed, submerging and escaping the British and French blockade. The Deutschland arrived in the German port of Bremerhaven, laden with supplies, nickel, tin, crude rubber, critical to the war effort. In Germany, the message was one of hope. In America, the message was one of stay out of the war. The Deutschland repeated the feat in November, carrying cargo to the port of New London, Connecticut. But the Imperial Navy sent an even more direct message, as the U-53 of the German Imperial Navy appeared in Newport, Rhode Island, making a courtesy visit to the U.S. Navy officials there. After the brief stop that was allowed by the rules of neutrality, the SMU-53 left American waters and commenced war operations, sinking vessels carrying contraband or flagged by nations at war with Germany within sight of America's shores. American naval vessels rescued the crews of the vessels, but had no legal right to interfere with the U-53's attacks. But, of course, if the goal was to keep America out of the war, the effort ultimately failed. There are many reasons that U.S. public opinion shifted and the U.S. chose to enter the war, but none more than the German policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. In January of 1917, the German Empire, trying to starve Britain as effectively as the British blockade had starved the Central Powers, declared that they would sink any ship in the war zone, even if they were from a neutral country, regardless of whether they carried contraband and without warning. The sinking of American merchant ships under these rules changed public opinion, and on April 6, 1917, the U.S. declared war. There is some indication that the German High Command actually expected that resuming unrestricted submarine warfare would draw the United States into the war, but they saw that as being nearly inevitable at that point, and they thought that they could actually win the war with their submarines. At the time that war was declared, there were three merchant submarines of the Deutschland design afloat. A fourth had been sunk by the British and four more under construction. With the U.S. in the war, there was no longer a need for an unarmed blockade runner, so the submarines were impressed into the Imperial German Navy as the Type U-151 long-range submarine. They were outfitted with four torpedo tubes and two 15-centimeter SKL-45 deck guns and numbered U-151 through U-157. 
the class with a cruising range of some 25,000 nautical miles was successful. The Deutschland, renamed the U-155, made three war cruises and sank 44 ships. But her sister ship, the U-156, would become a unique piece of history. The U-156 set sail on June 14, 1918 with a crew of 78 under the command of Captain Richard Felt. The submarine was sent to patrol and attack shipping along the U.S. East Coast and cause Schrecklichkeit, or roughly, chaos. The boat passed through the North Sea and the Northern Passage around the north of England. The submarine sank one British and two Norwegian ships along the way. The submarine laid a minefield in the shipping lanes off the south side of New York's Long Island. The U.S. Navy armored cruiser USS San Diego apparently struck a mine on June 18th of that year and capsized with a loss of six crew. It was the only major warship lost by the United States in World War I. The mine was thought to have been one of those lain by the U-156. The U-156 then headed south with the goal of wreaking havoc on the U.S. and Canadian fishing fleet in the western Atlantic. On July 21st, the submarine was off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and the tiny fishing town of Orleans. Being along an exposed section of coast, Orleans had already been a target in war, having to repel an attack by British Marines in 1814 during the War of 1812. 104 years later, war was again coming to the town. At 10.30 a.m., the tugboat Perth Amboy was hauling four barges along the coast to the Chesapeake Bay, completely unaware that a German U-boat was nearby. The U-156 opened fire with its deck guns on the tug and barges, which had, all told, 16 men, 12 women, and 4 children aboard. The captain of the tug, James Tapley, raised a white flag, hoping to prevent firing, but it was the submarine's job to sink shipping. Three of the barges went down quickly, but the tug and fourth barge refused to go down. The submarine was firing rapidly, eventually more than 150 shells. By now, the attack was attracting a crowd of locals who contacted the local station of the U.S. Life Saving Service. Under fire, the service launched a boat to rescue the crew of the tugboat. The station commander, Robert Pierce, contacted Chatham Naval Air Station, less than 10 miles away, where officers could already hear the firing. The Navy dispatched a seaplane, a Curtis HS-1. The crew of the U-156 was so intent shooting that they didn't notice the plane until it was almost on them. The plane managed to strike the submarine with its 100-pound bomb, but it didn't explode. A dud. A second plane, an R-9C plane, arrived and attacked again. A second bomb failed to explode. The pilot was said to be so frustrated that he threw a wrench at the submarine. The U-156, concerned that the planes would make a more coordinated attack, finally retreated and submerged. The four barges and their cargoes were lost, but the tug survived and was repaired and returned to service, eventually serving in the Second World War. While there were some injuries, there were no fatalities among those aboard the tug and barges. Some shells had gone long, landing along the beach and marshes. They had caused no casualties, but they represented the only Central Powers attack on the contiguous United States during the First World War, and the first time a foreign power had shelled the United States since the siege of Fort Texas during the opening stages of the War with Mexico in 1846. The event was dubbed the Battle of Orleans. There was speculation that the target may actually have been the station for a transatlantic cable that went from Orleans to Brest, France. The tug and barges had either been a target of opportunity or had simply stumbled into the line of fire. Having wreaked havoc and created some panic along the coast, the U-156 then swung north and attacked the American and Canadian fishing fleet, sinking more than two dozen fishing trawlers and barks. They seized one, the Canadian steam trawler Triumph, and placed 16 members of the U-boat's crew on board. She acted as a surface raider, sinking another half-dozen fishing boats before the ship became too well-known and they abandoned and sunk her. The U-156 sunk so many boats that the fishing captains refused to go to sea, essentially shutting down the Western Atlantic Bank's fishing fleet. They sunk another half-dozen boats in August, in all accounting for 34 vessels for a total of 33,582 gross tons. Running out of munitions and with her batteries running low, the U-boat then evaded the American and Canadian warships pursuing it and headed for home. But the boat's luck ran out. That summer, the U.S. Navy had been laying a massive minefield north of Britain's Orkney Islands called the North Sea Mine Barrage. The U-156 had radioed as it reached the barrage, indicating the route it had planned to take. But the message was intercepted, and the British had sent a submarine of their own to intercept them. The U-156 had managed to avoid the trap, but had submerged to do so. In traversing the minefield submerged, she had, apparently, struck a mine.
the U-156 never made it home, a presumed victim of the minefield. Submarines transformed the nature of warfare during the Great War and offered a challenge that navies found difficult to counter. The Imperial German Navy's 340 U-boats tied up thousands of Allied military vessels and airplanes and still managed to sink thousands of Allied merchant ships and significantly disrupt commerce and supply between the United States and Great Britain for a loss of 178 U-boats. The guns of the U-156 didn't do a lot of damage to the state of Massachusetts, but its voyage did a lot of economic damage to the United States and Canada and transform Americans' perceptions of the war. And that was just a small taste of what we would see with the U-boat attacks that would come during the Second World War. The voyage of the U-156 is history that deserves to be remembered. So we've talked a few times about uh, World War One submarines. It's really a period of <laughs> we went from submarines were kind of barely a thing and could only only had so much distance in the, at the beginning to by you know by even partway through World War One submarines had had massively matured <laughs> as a technology and absolutely very very quickly yeah. and, and totally transformed warfare absolutely. But I mean, who knew? I mean, this is really fun. who knew that there was ever built a a, a commercial submarine. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, today, because, you know, I guess drug runners, you don't run them today, use these submarines yeah. or whatever, and they, and, they, and they chase them. But, I mean, this was built, this is built to be a big transport ship, but a submarine that could that could get through the blockade. Yeah. So the Deutschland is really an interesting story, how it was built that way, that it was able to successfully make a trip and pick up, uh, you know, uh, uh, rare items that they needed yeah. and get back. Because America was technically neutral. If you could get through the blockade, then you could trade with the U.S. Uh, so it starts off with this really interesting story. Of the of the Germans with this massive uh, submarine, yeah, and then of course you find out that the, the moment that the, that you know they're at war with the United States, it's actually very much built to be turned into a warship. Very quickly. It was, I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, the, the, this concept, which is really cool, this idea of let's have uh, submarines that that can you know do this trans this this stuff to. I mean, that was in a lot of wars. You know, getting supplies is is well mm -hmm. is the most vital part. Of the of absolutely, the whole I mean, that's the whole battle of what the Atlantic was yeah. about. It was it was all about cutting off trade with each other. So a trade submarine, yeah. a, a transport submarine like that, is an interesting idea. And it's, it's something we you know we've never really even thought, even in the era of nuclear submarines, yeah. uh, no one seems to be making submarines to be carrying cargo. Which but, which makes you see maybe it was it was just not uh, um, not that not that efficient. And ultimately, uh, you're still better off in general. Uh, moving it on a big ship that you can put on, you know, you can make the ships much bigger. They can store much more efficiently. Um, but it, so it's only really when you know yeah. you're avoiding. But I mean, you're you're, you're trying but to you get through the, 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 the British blockade. Yeah, you know, that's why. So yeah, for they're sinking all these ships that are going out. I mean, maybe if you had the ability to move those by submarine, that that you know that could that could be impactful. It's true. I mean, it could be interesting because yeah. we can make submarines much larger. Today, but we don't seem to talk about that concept. Time. So, I mean, the the the, the visit of the of yeah. the of the ship is interesting. Of the of this large submarine is interesting. And and uh, at at the same time that another U boat just shows up yeah. in in Maryland too to say hi. Uh, and you know, and, and so, but it's very clear that a part of that, a really hidden part of that, is they're trying to yeah. keep America out of the war, and they're trying to warn America that our our shores are vulnerable to submarines. And the, the interesting thing is, yeah. we just didn't we didn't learn that lesson. I mean, both world wars, when the war started, we were utterly unprepared for the submarine menace. Uh, and so then, our, you know, her sister ship comes back and wreaks all sorts of havoc. And, and it ends and up being, totally I, I mean, in it. both wars, you know, the submarines end up being this huge existential threat. And you know, you you wonder if there was any, uh, if there was ever really enough uh, German submarines to cause you know enough chaos in the United States to to you know truly you know say blockade us or anything like that i don't i don't think there probably was ever really but that was never really the point either uh, the the goal was simply to threaten no i mean well the yeah. goal there was to keep america out of the war yeah but i mean certainly uh i mean certainly they very much oh, threatened yeah. the existence of england so summary warfare very much i mean england was completely dependent upon trade and, and import and you know that's interesting you know in, in today could that be true i mean uh, uh you know, if uh, if there was, would the submarine war be uh, yeah. still a possibility today? Or, you know, shoot, we might go nuclear instantly. But I mean, you know, uh, could there be, you know, if there was conflict, say, yeah. between the U.S. and China, which we, you know, we, you know, we hear always like some sort of fear of that. I certainly hope that's not coming or anything like that. But I mean, would there be a matter of trying to cut yeah. off each other's trade? Of course, you know, we trade so much between the two of us that, you know, all they have to do is not let Chinese ship leave China. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff we'd be in trouble on. But then, you know, they, they would be too, I guess. But uh 
It, it was, I mean, certainly a massive part of both wars was the attempt to cut off. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of when they moved back to unrestricted submarine warfare, knowing it would bring the United States into the war, was the hope that it would force England to its knees before the U.S. could, could enter the war. Uh, and so it was just, it was a matter of just threatening to say, you know, it's going to cost, it's going to hurt. Uh, and the, the submarine was, was able to do it. But, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, because they, uh, yeah. you know, they come and they bombard the United States. Who, who knew that the, the continental United States was attacked during the first World War. It's such an interesting little story. Yeah, the Battle of Orleans is not is not not a well known story. And I, I guess there's a there's there's a historical marker there. We're not no, even no, quite sure were. what they were shooting at. I mean, we don't know why they attacked. Why they attacked? Were they were they shooting at the cable station there? Yeah. They just popped up and sank some barges. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's also interesting that we what well, our response yeah. was to send warplanes after them. And you know, our warplanes were simply not prepared to attack a submarine uh you know they're the, throwing wrenches the fact at them that and the stuff. bombs the bombs were duds they kept they kept like twice were throwing bombs and yeah they, they were blown up close yeah. enough that we might have been able to yeah your whole your airplane has one bomb and, and the bomb doesn't blow up yeah. yeah i mean it shows how unprepared we were for you know we really weren't prepared to fight a war uh, and to defend our coasts uh, and so and it does it does seem to indicate that you know that it could have yeah. If if there had been a real assault on our coast, it could have been worse. Uh, and you know, the largest American ship lost during yeah. the war was lost because of mines that were laid by these submarines. Uh, but on the other hand, too, the you know the submarine never made it home. So I mean, it, it really is a microcosm yeah, the, of that the whole. The submarine battle the, was the interesting. But, it was you know, the idea how that dangerous they were it was to be a submarine and how yeah. uh, f how frightening they could be. Uh, but also, you know. The, 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 how difficult it is to be in a submarine and not hit a mine, and uh, those you know those were difficult. We were that that's that changing between it was yeah yeah in both in both wars for all our fear of the u-boat menace uh those were some of the deadliest places to be in the war yeah. was to be a u-boat it's just person. it's extremely dangerous and of course though you know the 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 submarine uh is able to the the one sinks all the fishing ships and like honestly puts a puts an end to fishing for a while and that's well, because why do you want to be? Yeah, why do you want to? Fishing, if you're just yeah, a they, fisherman, they, I mean, you have no desire to to be getting shot at by a submarine. I don't blame them at all for that. But yeah, so they, they capture yeah. a boat and use those pirates for a while. And, I mean, but I mean, it does. I mean, it was uh, it was an interesting bit of the again. You know, like like Nyasa. This is you know, no. people didn't really think about the First World War being fought off the coast of Canada or being fought yeah. off the coast of Massachusetts for heaven's sake. Uh, and uh, 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 people didn't think of being yeah. fought off the coast of New York. And that was our largest naval loss of the war. Uh, so I mean th that it was, and uh, you know, again, it shows that it was a world war. But I mean, it also shows the, how the technology changed. That while we had all yeah. these huge, massive ships, all these that were like the whole war was based on, we're, we're you know we're we're building more and more of these battleships, uh, and in the end, the damage is not coming from these battleships, but from these you know strange vessels yeah. that and no one had completely expected altered. to be able to sail and, and all it's the way true, across the you know, ocean. Uh, they totally they totally changed how warfare uh, works at sea. And one of the thing, one of the ways they did that is this, this concept of uh, unrestricted submarine warfare, where the whole you know there was this idea, and we we saw some of that. Like we we did an episode on the the Emden, uh, the, which was a German ship off in the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. and some of the some of the ways that they they were supposed mm -hmm. to you know you're supposed to capture the ship or fire a warning shot first and this stuff. And that was very difficult for the submarines when the whole the whole advantage of a submarine is that you're able to surprise them. Yeah, it's a surprise. So we've done a lot of those. We talked about Q ships. We talked about yep. the attack on Scapa Flow. We talked about Charles Fryatt. I mean, the, 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 yep. they raise moral questions and ethical questions and legal questions. And, you know, you feel like yeah, if you are attacked by a ship, then you, you have the right to defend your ship. But then that means that, you know, gives the U-boats more reason to attack from surprise. And, I mean, all that stuff uh, that we talk about a lot in the Second World yep. War really developed in the First World War, as well as anti-submarine, I mean, uh, depth charges uh, developed during the First World War because of the submarine menace uh, acoustic hydroacoustic hearing and all the stuff that's all that that, that was so important uh i mean that was all yeah. we were completely unprepared and germany was we started. so far ahead yeah germany was so far ahead on these on these submarines so te technologically uh in it was well i mean the, the 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 british submarine service they had good submarines but the british the british royal navy thought it was kind it's of interesting to, to attack with submarines and they thought that the submariners were were undisciplined uh and so they the, uh but um, that's interesting because up in the baltic it was the british submarines that were attacking the trade between sweden and, and germany and uh, japan yeah. operated submarines in the mediterranean Sorry, which is really really weird war. right that's the kind and, of stuff uh, but that's was, uh, talking about how it's a world war i mean this is this is the kind of stuff but it is interesting that these uh you know, this it's unexpected the way that these naval battles were fought ultimately. Uh, given, like you said, it was all about battleships, yeah. and ultimately we did we did episodes on like the the, the Grand Fleet and the USS Texas, and uh, we did. 
Yeah, yeah the, the Texas, Texas was Texas never really got to shoot. Yeah, never got to shoot anything. Shot yeah. or something at least once or twice, but yeah, ultimately uh, they were. The, the only the only threat they really faced were submarines, and for the most part, the Germans. That's true. Well, the, the only battleship to sink a submarine during the war yeah. was Dreadnought, was HMS Dreadnought, and it rammed a submarine. So, I mean, there's there's interesting stories with those. We also had we, uh, we, uh, one of the episodes was about a yeah. surface ship trying to fight with Zeppelins. You know, that was not stuff that, that's no. not stuff that you expected it was going to be. You expected that uh, uh, that it was going to be a new Trafalgar. You expected there was going to be a huge battle between the ships. And by the time they were even contemplating that, uh, the, the the German Navy had lost its morale and, and mutiny. Yeah, and that's, that's which is an amazing the story. That uh, that, so that I mean, it is, it is. It's, yeah, the, the the naval war of World War One is really an interesting, largely untold, largely ununderstood story, misunderstood story. And this is one of those that 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 that, that floated a, a U-boat all the way through the United States. Well, at first they floated a submarine all the way through the United yeah. States just to trade with the United States, just to break the British blockade. And then they they brought uh, uh, the, the same. It's it was a sister ship, but they brought the same class of U-boat back and totally terrorized. The, the, the yeah. east coast of the United States and, and shut down the Outer Banks fishing and, and, and uh, uh, sank uh, the, the San Diego. Uh, and I mean, it was absolutely, a, you know, it, it all is just a compelling story. And again, a story that's not really told. I mean, when, when you talk about First World War, all we really tend to hear about yeah. is the major battles on the Western Front. And, and the, you know, the rest of that just doesn't really make it into the public consciousness. Well, one of the ways at you least can really tell that's true is when you think about World War One, people think trench warfare. And that was the Western Front. Uh, but I mean, mm -hmm. the Eastern Front was a totally, totally different mm -hmm. war. Uh, yeah, m much yeah, less it was like much that. more maneuver. Uh, certainly, the yeah. certainly the fighting in Africa was was all fighting and maneuver. It was you know it was the trench warfare. So, yeah, we you know when you conjure your in your mind the the the, the First World War, you think of the barbed wire and the trenches and the, and the no man's land and all that sort of stuff. And that was really oh yeah, that one front, <laughs> now a horrible front of the war. And but, ultimately, I mean, it was, I mean, one, it was one part it was of the a war. part of the part of the war too. And it's it's really where. Um, because that, that was attacks on the you know the homelands of the main uh, for, for most of the main uh, mm -hmm. uh, belligerents. So I mean you understand why that one was was so so focused on. But we totally forget the rest of it. I think that when people think about the naval war, uh, if you know a little bit about the naval war, World War One, you're like, ah, oh, there wasn't really one. <laughs> they they essentially the ships all just hung out and didn't shoot at each other. And I you know once you look more into it, there was plenty of interesting stuff. It's, it's a there are there were, the, there were the commerce raiders and there were and yeah some of those stories we haven't told yet but I think that we were, I haven't, I haven't talked about the first battle of the Falklands uh, Falklands uh, yeah, yeah, there's I mean there's some stuff. there's some other uh, but I mean uh, you know the, yeah, from from yeah. uh, you know Lake Miasa uh, to the, the the shore of of, of Massachusetts uh, this is not where they thought the naval battle would be fought by not the ships that they thought it would be fought by. Uh, and that makes it interesting. And you have to you have to wonder, uh, you know, if you're you know if you're I mean, apparently at his family board, you're just the captain of a of a yeah. boat pushing a barge, you know, suddenly get out <laughs> of Massachusetts. I'd, How did you become a casualty of war? Yeah, right. Oh, all and of a sudden, were you exactly, under fire? That's yeah. exactly what the Germans were trying to to show us was that we could. Uh, the, the U.S. has never really had to deal with this concept of truly defending our i mean we have an enormous coastline and we've mostly that's uh, you know mm -hmm. the saving grace has been that we've been very very far away uh and no one's really had you know the ability to move large numbers of troops onto that coastline but it, it would be it's difficult to build enough defenses to you know protect this yeah. huge huge coastline and we were we were unprepared in both wars and we spent a lot of time in both wars being very afraid of what that you know what that might mean i think that that was in terms of anxiety for the home front a rather large part of it was, you know, what happens if submarines uh, mm -hmm. release troops and they, you know, something like that. I mean, what if what what if something like that happens? Yeah. yeah. How prepared are we for that? Yeah. If they if they land yeah. saboteurs or whatever they're landing, yeah. You know, if a, a ship that big, they would, if they'd shown up with a hundred yeah. troops, how much damage could they have done? You know, before yeah. we would have been able to respond. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.